Q&A. Go for it. Good evening. So, I don't even recall where we are. But <laughs> it's I'm been a busy week. <laughs> it's Friday morning, isn't it? And this goes out tonight. Brilliant. Yes, Freya has had a phenomenal amount of projects on this week. I've had about half as many as her, but it's still losing track of where we are is very easy. So this is Monday's questions and we're in Friday. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and by the way, no mocking your father. We're very happy to be here. Very. <laughs> but we're very confused and knackered. <laughs> Well, <laughs> it's um, yeah, we've been doing a lot of filming. So, as you guys probably know, we've been doing the art course and um, we've been doing every week live. But also, what we've been doing alongside that is filming, having professionally filmed those modules. So, hopefully, once this course is over, maybe even before, we can offer those as digital downloads um, so what we'd like to do is we'd like to continue live courses but we'll be doing those sort of every couple of months maybe is the plan or every quarter um, but we wanted these filmed sessions as well for people who um, just want to do it in a different format and maybe find it difficult structuring their time around the six week module, yeah. module well, format You've seen what it looks like professionally because the, the Monday session was filmed by Matt, wasn't it? Yeah, so with we. The green screen. The last two live sessions we've done with Matt, um, who hasn't had the benefit of being able to edit anything and also had to suffer our Wi Fi. Um, but <laughs> so the recorded course will be much, much smoother. Um, but yeah, those last two sessions were great and they were because Matt helped us do the green screen and the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. There was an odd lag when it went out on Facebook between what we said and the image. Mm. But we'll have that version synced yeah. up. In the recorded version, there's no lag. Mm. Okay. So we have your questions, these are from Monday, and on Monday, um, what are we doing on Monday? Logos, Logos and fonts. Logos and sketchbooks <laughs> and fonts, and uh, so these are all questions mostly to do with Dad's logos, and we were going through the sketchbooks as well. So there yeah. were lots of people commenting they'd really like a book of the sketchbooks and logos as a separate kind of thing. Well. Yes, me too, and um, I think we're going in that direction, but if we have any news in that, we'll let you know, but definitely I would like to see the sketchbooks eventually published, even if it's only in small quantities. A lot of people also wanted their own, so those leather bound sketchbooks with the tracing paper or the typo detail paper bound in, mm. and this is all part of what I hope to be a scheme to start our own stationery company <laughs> that we can include those lovely books. Follow Freya. <laughs> yeah. Follow Freya's. We'll have to figure out how to do that. It would be good fun to do, for sure. Mm. Um, they're bigger than normal sketchbooks, which typically have 100 pages. The ones we've had banned are typically three. 150, 400 pages. So but the paper's much thinner, isn't it? The paper is thinner than cartridge paper, but it is absolutely standard thickness for detail and typo detail and tracing paper. It's literally, I buy that in the art store. We'll have to figure out what we can do about that. Yeah. It's an expensive way to do it because um, when a book is bound, the grain of the paper, and paper has a grain like wood, has to go in the right direction. So sometimes, you know, we, it's a very wasteful process because we can't take the most economic angle 
from the paper we bought. But it's for me, it's very well worth it because I love the fact that the sketches are there, they're sequential, they're chronological-ish, and it, it's a great reference. Well, so we'll look into it, we'll look into it. Should we start with the questions? Hmm. Okay, do you, I, I thought this was a very good question. Do you use, this, so Stuart asks, do you use the same distraction techniques when designing logos and lettering? Or does it require a different concentration? Um, it's absolutely the same distraction techniques because I'm not reading the text as text. I might write down before I start the word so I don't lose track of it, but I don't read it anymore. From that first instance, it's nothing to do with reading and the distraction of reading is irrelevant because I'm treating it simply as shapes and the distraction process of you know typically listening to a really great story on audio works perfectly when I'm doing logos it wouldn't if I was having to read it but I don't have to read it I find it completely different I find if I'm designing something I can't listen to words really mm. When I'm painting what I know I want to paint, if I'm copying, I can listen to a story. But if I'm designing, maybe my brain uses, crosses over more with the sort of verbal stuff than yours in the designing stage. Maybe. Maybe. Hmm. We've got any... Well, I, I think it works very well just to treat it as a pattern on the paper. Um, once I've got the word, I no longer need to read it. I don't need to read yes, 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 yes. Once was enough. I've got the order of the shapes. That's it. End so do, story. You, do you not have an inner monologue, which is like, oh, maybe I should move this down and left and that's not working and then da 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 da. You don't have that. Um, I, I, yes, of course I do. but. I am in the process of trying to do it silently, intuitively, without being logical about it. So my inner dialogue... Dialogue? You've got two people in there. Ten, fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we all have dialogues really rather than monologues. Because yeah. you respond to yourself, don't you? Yes, but I, I try not to. That's the point. I mean, the point is to try not to because thinking about something is a disruptive factor, an inhibiting factor. And I find it much more enjoyable getting out of that uh, hardwired track, letting my mind wander. When my mind is wandering, it isn't wandering without a dialogue, but the dialogue isn't isn't planning and constructing and analysing. It's just drifting around. Hmm. Must be nice. <laughs> That's the point. It really it really works best when it's great and it's relaxing and it's entertaining. I wonder whose voice I have in my head telling me I'm not getting it right. <laughs> Someone who you should shoot. <laughs> I'm not pointing any fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not at all. <laughs> Let's move on. Walter asks, your architecture has a very organic feel to it. Have you seen the works of Paolo Solari's Arcasanti series? If so, what do you think of his works? I've only seen it in pictures. I've not been there. Although I had planned to this year. I did think I would go down and have a look. But um, I've looked at a lot of people whose work is organic. And I love it by and large, a sort of a generalization. But it's not based on the same theories as mine. Mine's very much determined by making defensible spaces. Um, 
I have said it's 80% about defendable spaces because that is what makes people feel comfortable and relaxed. The other 20% is aesthetic. And in that aesthetic, there are similarities. Um, I, I mean, really, really enjoyed the ceramic work of Gaudi, for example. Um, some circular stuff, which I get constantly referred to is people who build homes for example out of geodesic ho geodesic domes and for me they profoundly don't work and the reason they don't work is they have really awkward accidental spaces when they try and chop it up with straight lines inside and for me they are even more uncomfortable than mainstream modernist blocks. I've got a question. Um, if a defendable or defensible space is what makes us feel more comfortable, are there people who that affects more than others? Um, I'm thinking about that because obviously like as quite a short, um, weak woman, <laughs> Just walking down the street, I feel more vulnerable than I suspect I would if I was a six foot six man. And I'm wondering, is there any difference in terms of, obviously we're all vulnerable when we're asleep, so we all need safe spaces where, to, where we sleep. But I'm wondering if, if someone's experience of life, their experience of conflict or safety or you know their physical size does that affect how much that defensible space is a necessary thing to make them feel comfortable what if you're huge and strong and you've got gums everywhere do you still feel like you need this defensible space or would you want a tower that you can sit atop and you know d does your position in life affect that uh, the simple think? answer is the juxtaposition of spaces is universal amongst human beings no matter how big and strong you are, you always feel vulnerable at the back of your neck. The example I gave about how the ferret would often hesitate about going down a rabbit warren if there was a, a tunnel around and above the entrance. So it affects everybody and it does affect mammals as much as humans. So we all have that sense of vulnerability here and we have it in terms of the spaces we occupy. Um, you know in Japan they have a very refined sense of who is in charge of defending the dining table by the way people sit around it. So it affects everybody, it affects absolutely everybody but it's much more important if you feel vulnerable and I think um, we need to profoundly rethink our cities in every way. Uh, it's we have so few cities that actually work for human beings and if we made streets that felt safe I think we their first be. rule is to make them safe I think we may be covering similar territory to our last q and if we go down this yeah we may but some things stand repeating and repeating and repeating <laughs> <laughs> it's friday can we i do it when prayer's not here <laughs> you'll have plenty of time for that when I go back and then okay. you can talk about whatever you like but <laughs> not while I'm here. Ah, ah. Will asks have you ever done a no logo for fun? You might sell a lot of yes and no's e.g. for parliamentary and other voting places. Will give me a break. <laughs> you have you though? Have you? No I haven't but you wouldn't ask that question Will if you knew how many times I'd been asked that. Oh really? Yeah. I've never seen anyone ask that question. Oh, well, not on these Q&As, but it's something I get asked really all the time. Why don't you just do it and then people stop asking? And then we could, we could sell little pin badges, yes and no pin badges. <laughs> <laughs> oh, See, yeah. I'm getting asked again. What can I do? I guess just I'm, do it. I'm being asked by the right person this time, so maybe I, I, she'll twist my arm in doing it. Yes, that is the way to get to Dad ask me to ask him and I will try she'll only try if she thinks it's a good idea then yeah I hope 
Elliot says, do you like the paintings of insects by Richard Lewington? Well, I should look them up. I'll look them up while I ask the next question. How about that? That's a good idea. Sorry, everyone. We should have done that before. Um, oh, Michael, uh, Mike Mahoney asks, how about blank sketchbooks for sale? Just, yeah, like we were talking about. Um, Maddie asks, for logos, do you generally start with the lettering or with the pictures? Well, it <coughs> depends what I'm given, to be honest. It's, um, I'm losing my voice. I'm just going to get a drink. Wait a second. <laughs> so um, I'm just looking up Richard. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this exactly. Lewington, I'm guessing. Um, his work. Oh, it's very beautiful. Oh, yeah, we've got all of his books. These are very familiar to me. He must have illustrated, yeah, all of the insect books that, one well, of all of them, many of the insect books that we have. This guy. He did these. But this is all very familiar, isn't it? Uh, natural history, natural history illustration. Yes, beautiful. Yeah. <coughs> well, I apologise for not knowing his name instantly, but I know his work and it's fantastic. Yeah. Me too. I mean, that was what I studied was scientific and natural history illustration. So I definitely should know. But I do know his work. We both do. Yeah. Not the name immediately. So were you... You were talking about the logos with the pictures and which comes first, and it depends. Yes. <clears throat> when I did the Yes logo, while it only ever really existed as a word for a long, long time, Asia was just the word Asia for the first album, but by the second album, the eyes became an integral part of the logo, and it was used that way for a long time. Um, I have got an example here. I did this for a company. This is a griffin. And I did it for a company whilst they were scrabbling around trying to figure out a name for their company. So it existed prior to the company name. And Cygnosis, while we were working again, working on the name, the owl as an idea, as, as a heraldic creature was being developed and probably preceded the final logo of the word because it existed before the word, the name was agreed on. So it works both ways. There isn't a rule. Was it an owl because of knowledge and gnosis or a different reason? It was exactly that reason. It was because Gnosis, in, as in Cygnosis, is a made-up word, but Gnosis comes from the Greek knowledge. I know. I wasn't telling you. I was <laughs> telling the universe. They and everyone who's James. not Greek. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who are, <laughs> that's not the pronunciation I would imagine. <laughs> I don't doubt it. You're right. Um... Yeah, it was funny actually, like um, there was some question on QI about what Greek words have a silent P and the answer was that none of them do because the Greek pronunciation you pronounce the P like psyche oh. and I did know that because I named one of my pieces of artwork psyche and, um, and mum's friend Rhea who's Greek said I must stop calling it psyche because it's psyche <laughs> and when I did classics she was always correcting my Greek pronunciation and I feel like how is she so sure that ancient Greek didn't pronounce it like how I pronounce it now oh they go and ask an ancient Greek <laughs> what else would you do I suppose the same is true of Latin there's lots of arguments well, in about English, how Latin is lots of people don't you know, know for sure necessarily about how old English all the words were pronounced. There's lots of disagreements about different things, isn't there? I, I guess more because the spelling 
confuses people. We see written in touristy villages, ye oldie sweetie shoppy. But it would have been pronounced the old sweet shop because Y was pronounced the. And donkey would have been thonky because the, the D was a TH sound. And vice versa. You see murder, but it's written as mother. Mother. But it was a harder sound of murder. So <coughs> the spellings give us a more confusing idea of how words are originally pronounced. Let's go and get some ancient Britain recordings. That will settle the argument. Yes. Okay. Just want going back to when we did do the thing, people like the cat and they like this cat. Actually, this is a good point for the which comes first, the picture or the logo, because this is both, isn't it? Uh, this version of the logo, the, the um, so this is a cat, butterfly, and this is the Yes logo that was used on that tour with it. So this went logo, picture, logo again, didn't it? Yeah. That design. yeah. And for the next tour, we're using that butterfly and a logo, which is, exists somewhere in this room, <laughs> I can't find it right now, that was done in the same way as that. So, yeah. Chengis asks, you would tell us your deserted island paintings from other painters. Forgot? Question <laughs> mark. <laughs> no, just confused. Try <laughs> run that by me again. So I think, well, what he's saying is, uh, before you said you'd give us your desert island paintings. Oh, and you said you'd right, about right. It. My list of ten favourite paintings. You mm. don't have to do ten right now. Have any more occurred to you that you think? Well, I, I, I'll own up and say I did forget, and I will. You remind me, and I'll do it. Okay. You have to understand, though, if I do it and I finish it before lunch, it would be a different list by tea time and a different list by the following morning. So it's a very much a movable feast. I'm going to say a couple because I have a couple that are springing to mind. I like. I like where you get two in one, or three in one, or a hundred and one. So I said Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch the last time. Because you get, you get like a thousand paintings in one painting. But also, um, I really liked Gustave Courbet did a self-portrait of himself called L'Homme Blessé, the wounded man. And he had this bloody chest wound over his heart. And they only figured out, like, very recently, in the last, I think, 30 years or something, by scanning it, that originally he'd painted his girlfriend there, and she'd broken up with him. So then he painted over her a wound. Isn't that sad? Yeah. But I thought, that's a two-in-one, because that's got a <laughs> great story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we do two lists, Freya's and mine. Mine will be... A list of ten, and Freire's would be a list of ten representing a hundred. Mm. Yes, you want to get bang for your buck if you only get ten, don't you? <laughs> to take on the desert island. <laughs> mm. I loved Botticelli's stuff as well when we went to the Uffizi in Italy. I couldn't believe it. Lots of these things you only see in books, and you don't realise that the reason they're so incredible is because they really are. The reason you know them so well is because they yeah. really are just amazing. And you have to take some big ones like um, Mucha's Slav Epic. A yes. couple of them, just in case you get bored and you need somewhere to live. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they're huge. <laughs> yes, they'd make a great tent they would if make you a, needed some they emergency. They would make <laughs> the most sublime tent. <laughs> yeah, the that's epic. extravagance, that's luxury. A tent made out of a Mucha painting. Yeah, someone get that on Redbubble, <laughs> or a, or a company that doesn't steal off Dad. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can think about that, can't we? Okay. Do you use drafting tools when designing these logos? Mike asks. Hmm. Well, I did a a, a, a painting. Tuesday of an eagle and um, I used a circle template to do the eye and I guess if I'm doing painting an animal I like to get the eyes right and I'm 
averagely good at painting a circle but if it takes me two seconds to draw one and then paint to that drawing yes I will do it but with the exception of the Asia logo where I did use a ruler both to get the straight lines and to do the measurements pretty much every other logo and font almost every other logo and font was originally drawn freehand and the Yes logo for example for 30 years all the early variations were done by hand about 20 years ago we built a, a vector file version of it so it was easier to change but in the process of making it easier to change it became more streamlined and that's one of the things that a vector file does so it's slicker and I like it slicker I also like it freehand when I did the original freehand logo it fitted on an A3 sheet of paper so it was about so big and I, I had a policy then of drawing curves you know if you do that you can get a very smooth curve working from the wrist elbow and shoulder there's a great deal of fluidity in those lines but there isn't a great deal of accuracy you know if I if I did this sort of I would miss by a large amount so in my attempt to get the curves right um, if I'm trying really hard to stay exactly on a line it'll drift off so what I would allow myself to do is to vibrate the pen so there's a very slight vibration in the pen which allows me to correct constantly so if you look at the lines of the original drawings of a yes logo for example it does look like there's a vibration in it and that is purposely done so I can do constant corrections without having big lumps that are wrong it's just microscopic errors but lots of them do you still do that? Yeah. Did you, this is my question, did you imagine when you were doing that logo that it would become as familiar and well known and iconic? What? Sorry. Um, <laughs> but it is. <laughs> I didn't um, even know it would be used. Wow. I'd, I'd done Fragile for Yes. They hadn't asked Don't me kick to. The ladder, ooh, the camera's on that. Right. They didn't ask me to do a second album when I'd done, I'd done that. So I did it because to satisfy myself, I just thought, yeah, I could do a really cool logo out of these three letters. And I. I it's a sort of apocryphal tale, but it's actually true. I came down from London one day on the Brighton Bell early and had a kipper breakfast which is me being flash and in that just under an hour journey from Victoria to to um, Brighton besides eating the kipper I drew the yes logo and it was six sketches one above the other and the final one was almost exactly how it ended up being did it on the train I did it on the train <laughs> so that added even more wobbles but it wasn't the, f the final drawing was done in my studio and all those sketches are in the Victoria and Albert Museum there I wish I'm very flattered about that would be such a wonderful train journey wouldn't it like mum and I did that train holiday in France and of course it's wonderful looking out the window but that would make a really interesting like sketching holiday as well wouldn't it like trying to catch things <laughs> out the window or just doodling or drawing while you're on a train it's maybe like a really relaxing kind of space I, I do it everywhere whenever I travel I, I, for example I know um, most of the design for the Yes album Heaven and Earth was done while I was in transit to a design conference in Melbourne and my flight was stopped for quite a long time in Hong Kong and uh, they offered all kinds of because the, the my clients were very kindly flying me out first class I could stop have a shower have a meal in a restaurant this was all in Hong Kong not on the aeroplane but I did that drawing sitting at a dining table and 
I do sitting on the plane I draw sitting in the waiting room I draw it's kind of a non-stop process for me and it doesn't feel like work <laughs> thank god it still doesn't feel like work I was just looking out sorry I was just thinking what about have you seen on the Orient Express they have that like open end that's just all glass so you can sit in like a sort of sitting room at the yeah. end of the train and just watch it that would be a wonderful thing to try and sketch as you're going along so you know just if anyone wants to get me or, or dad as well but mostly me <laughs> um, a Venice Simplon be careful, ticket be careful what you wish for because actually doing Orient it on Express, a plane Venice is easier than on a train I don't care I just want to go on the Orient Express well do it don't do it don't do it as a sketching I can't project. afford it that's oh. why I'm saying it on here just in case you outrageous person <laughs> I haven't asked for anything else. Behave. Or have I? <laughs> Behave. <Maybe> I did. <laughs> no one has to buy me a ticket for the Orient Express. But I wouldn't say Except no me. if you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't afford it either. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Next question. Stuart asks. You said during the painting sessions that just a piece of the artwork would be used for the cover and then the logo is added. Have you ever conceived the whole album cover simultaneously, more Musha like or Mucha, or however you say it? Hmm. I've often conceived of it as the finished thing, but I've always separated them out for execution. Yeah. In my sketchbook, when we did this talk on Monday, there were sketches where the lettering was essentially invented lettering, and it was seen as as a combined painting with lettering. And yeah, so in that process of designing. I think I st showed um, a mermaid with lettering, my recollection. I remember. Yes, I believe I did. There were several though that were combined drawings and lettering. I think of it more when I'm doing posters than when I'm doing an album cover, but yeah, I often do. But I don't try and execute them together. They're always separated. Why? So you can use them separately, or yeah, for one reason. But I like this. I like the standalone quality. I can, you know, a painting is looser than it looks, and I like the crispness of doing painting. Uh, sorry, doing the drawing for the lettering. So I kind of draw the lettering and paint the painting. They could be combined, but they work better for me separately. And I, I mean, if I did something like the Asia Alpha album combined, which I could have, I'd have been doing incredibly precise, really tiny lettering. It would have been nigh on impossible. Mm. But when I did that logo, the logo was bigger than the painting by about 10 inches. It was that big and the painting was so big. So it was... Um, anyone would see the errors there in a way they wouldn't see them in the looseness of a painting hmm. David asks are you a rock hound in brackets collector of stones yeah literally or in your paintings or both both yeah, I could show you, shall I? Yeah. I thought when I was like reading that question, I thought it was interesting because um, painting is a way of collecting things, isn't it? I kind of feel like often yes. one of the things that's so satisfying about it is if you see something really beautiful, like a sky or an animal or anything, you can capture it without having to take or move anything 
and being able to make it yourself without relying on technology is just that much more satisfying again. It's not the same as a photograph where you need a piece of technology because in a painting or a sketch you can just have something that makes a mark and something to mark on and if you get good at it you can collect almost anything that you like. Am I talking to myself or are you listening? You listening to me? Sorry? Are you listening to me? <laughs> Am I talking to myself? Yes, you're speaking to yourself. Be careful. Well, I hope you guys will listen. Okay. A couple more. Hang on. I've run out of things to say to myself. <laughs> that easily? Okay. You might need to go closer than that. This is iron pyritis, and it comes out of the cliff in Dover. So when my brother and I lived in Dover, whenever there was a storm and there was a cliff fall, we would go along looking for them and find them on the beach. Is that fool's gold? Yes, it does have gold in it, but it's mostly iron and nickel. But is it what's called fool's gold? Sometimes, yes. Um, we do have a lot of ordinary pebbles found on the beach. It's very heavy. It is, yeah. This one's the opposite. This is a, a pebble found on the beach, but it's... It's volcanic lava. So it's been ground into a pebble shape but it's full of pits from exploding gas when it was cooling. Where's that from? That's from Hawaii. Um, there's people who have a phobia of things that have this texture. Is that? Yeah, I can't remember what it's called, but a friend of mine's flatmate had it, and it's particularly like with lotus seed pods and things like that, anything that has lots of holes. Oh. They get really freaked out and uncomfortable. Like there's a skin disease that looks like that, and I think that's where it comes from. Scary. So that one is um, found on the roadside in Nevada. Can be stopped. And I can't remember this. I think it's the same. And I've drawn both of those last two. And this is, how is that pronounced? Suiseki. Suiseki. Okay. Suiseki. And I have a number of books on collecting stones, and this is one of them. So, yeah. I have a look. Yeah. So this is where they've just taken a stone and put and framed it by giving it a wooden base. Yeah. Or a little gravel garden. Yeah. I'll have to have a look at this. Sorry, that's they are, they're very beautiful. In my own time. <laughs> I mean the the one thing about found objects is they can be every bit as beautiful as a work of art. The thing about a work of art isn't that it is the ultimate in beauty, it's the ultimate human expression of it, hopefully. Nature does a pretty damn good job there. Is that question answered? Hmm. Yeah, good. Good, good. So Andrew asks, having grown up spending time as a shipwright, I love the two ships from Fragile. Did you ever consider doing larger and more detailed versions of those two ships? Love your work and really enjoy these looks into your world. The Again, the answer is yes. Uh, there was a, a, a model maker in LA asked to do a collaboration making one of those. Um, and he made a very neat model, but I haven't been diligent doing my share of the job, and that's furnishing a complete set of drawings. That's not a trivial thing. Um, I have, and I'm much more interested in doing this, thought of making a 
full size model of the ornithopter plane that I've used as a logo since college days. So yeah, very much like to go there one day. But the number of projects which I'd love to do is going to exceed multiple lifetimes. I'll need a big team to do it. Working on that. So we also had an email question from Hassan. Um, actually, it was there were two questions. One of which Dad didn't understand, but I'll read it anyway. <laughs> Should I read it anyway? Yeah. So um, if you understand it. <laughs> could I ask if there is any soft world building consistency to your work? We don't understand what this means. So Hassan, if you could. <laughs> write us back <laughs> or we'll try googling that well, the bit we don't understand is what is soft world what's the soft world building soft world building yes I mean I, I speculated but I was sure I was wrong we worked with um, an incredibly clever team of Russians when they were working on a uh, working with us uh, I was working with them and Michael Kaluta on a computer game called Secret of the Black Onyx and we were with them in Moscow and they developed a software called World Builder which was software I wondered if that's what you were referring to but not being sure what you're referring to means any answer is going to be astonishingly inadequate the second so, yeah. part we got we got much easier <laughs> Uh, and I know that sometimes the rock shapes that are used are based off rocks from Cornwall or the US and that you made note of the Grand Canyon but I was wondering whether the Yellow Mountain in Huang Shan, China has had any effect on your work upon my visit there or really the first time I was made aware of it I, find it, I found it very reminiscent of your work with its smooth worn rocks, mist and pine trees I would say that's a yes, but not from the photograph. Yeah, it's indirect. Um, I spent two years in Hong Kong in 1957 through 1959. And everywhere I went in the town, we lived it, um, in the New Territories overlooking Hong Kong Harbour, but on the mainland side. And in the town, everywhere, I spent nearly as much time on the island as I did on the mainland, but in the town, everywhere, there was examples of traditional Chinese watercolours. And the three elements, mountains, waterfalls and pine trees, just was everywhere. And I loved them. And the influence was very marked that age which was 12 through 14 so I would say yes the influence is definitely there but not direct and not through photographs um, really from a, from a childhood memory of the watercolour paintings you know you you get a bl blinds for the windows bamboo strips and on it would be painted one of these scenes you would get them on table mats on everything cups and saucers it was everywhere and I loved it so the answer is it was an influence but I never knew exactly where it was and Hong Kong absolutely didn't look like that I guess I could say I did as well then couldn't I because I grew up with the pictures of the pictures that you grew up with <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> of the pictures of the <laughs> Hong Kong people who'd seen those mountains and gradually it filtered down well, me. <laughs> but in Tokyo, you've just seen things that are similar. Yes, yeah. It's called Sui Bokuga. And that's that kind of um, water wash. Uh, the aerial perspective is really obvious in those types of paintings because they have very watered down ink washes for the background and they mm. thicken the ink up as you come to the foreground. Mm. So they do the same exactly almost as you do, but in ink rather than acrylic. Mm. Yeah. Was there a question about computer games? Mm -hmm. There was a question from Eric, um, which was uh, a session focusing on the video game work experience. 
I was told by Michael Kaluta that you two were collaborating together for a company in LA in the 1990s, spending a lot of time working poolside, but the game was never published. Question mark. Well, two questions there, I guess. Yes, I did work with Michael Kaluta, and he was brilliant, a brilliant artist, a brilliant designer, and fabulous company. It was really, really great fun working with him. You know him, don't you? Yeah. Yes. Michael Kaluta is a serious, what can I say? someone I really love and I wish we spent more time with him. Working with him on that project was wonderful. I had the responsibility of putting together all the content ranging from packaging through landscapes, figures. I'm going to say we'll call whoever that is back to later, shall I? If you like. Sorry everyone. We haven't figured out how to turn the phones off yet. Hello. Um, Dad said hide the earpiece, so I stuffed them under cushions, and that didn't work because Dad didn't realise the bases make noise as well. Uh, I tried unplugging it; that did work, but probably caused some other problems. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, working with Michael was fantastic. Some of the, um, as I said, I was responsible for all the content, ranging from packaging, landscape, architecture, characters and story and music. And Michael took over doing the characters, which he did brilliantly. And he also took over responsibility for stories. And he got Elaine Lee to come in and work on the stories, which she did brilliantly. So. Michael and Elaine Lee did massively wonderful work. And it's really sad that the project never saw the light of day because everything that was done was fantastic. The music was fantastic. Um, we have about an hour and a half's worth of music. It was wonderful. And it sh it's a crime that it's not out there. I mean, maybe one day we should finish it because although the technology has moved on, the art and the music is definitely still valid. So, in the pile with Jodorowsky's Dune <laughs> of things that should be made. That should be made. Well, Michael and I pretty much finished our part. Um, the part that really wasn't finished was essentially the gameplay. The Russian guys who were doing the... Uh, landscapes with world builder they did an amazing job and the japanese team did an amazing job too yeah it should be finished if only we had all the money and we could just hire everyone to do the work for all these things indeed well it's there and one day it may get woken up but it's there resting for the moment um, working with Michael he was brilliant he, most people think of Michael as a, as a great artist which he unquestionably is but he is a fantastic designer as well um, I remember a debate with Hank who was the publisher of the game and he was talking about Frank Rosetta and I said Frank has got a fabulous facility when he's painting figures. But I said, Michael is inventive. You know, Frank Frazetta's stuff look fabulous when he paints them. But when they're translated to somebody else making them a digital model of them or whatever, they lose a lot and they were hard to... You can't see the magic that was Frank Frazetta once they've gone through the mill of being interpreted but because this design that Michael did was so strong and it was so inventive that when other teams around the world particularly in Russia where they modeled all Michael's work the strength of the design shone through and he was amazing 
amazing to work with and an amazingly clever guy wonderful person should we do a talk about the computer games I don't know is the answer to that because all the work we did all the work I did all the work Michael did is essentially what we would do anyway paintings drawings um, and so on we did no computer work although we did do some incredibly early versions of um, oh, motion capture I think we did some of the first motion capture that was ever introduced but of course it, that too didn't see the light of day but it was super clever super amazing but the technology now has moved on which is no bad thing the art as I say is timeless I really liked it when uh, we were in New York and we'd done some project somewhere when we were on our way home but it sort of overlapped between one thing and another with my birthday so we met up with Michael in New York and went out for sushi and yes. as we were heading out the door he put this smart jacket on over his t-shirt and we were getting in the lift and I noticed it had a little skull and crossbones on it and I said oh, I like your pin badge and he said well I don't like piercings and I don't like tattoos so this is how I show I'm edgy <laughs> I thought that was so lovely. <laughs> it was like, I'll put the jacket on as a nod to your birthday, but I have to have a little badge on so people don't get the wrong idea. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did, did you, were you in his studio? Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's an Aladdin's cave. We miss you, Michael. <laughs> yeah, we should go over, well be a while I guess before we can go anywhere yes was that the last question um, pretty much um, any more we'll get to we're kind of running over quite a lot though so okay. I think we should wrap up um, yeah okay well on Monday we are doing a live session talking about stages going back to the first stages we did 1973 47 years ago <laughs> that was mostly Martin and I and coming forward to 2008 when Frere and I worked on an opera and all the stages before and after also what we're doing at the moment is um, because the course is going so well and it's definitely become something that dad and I really want to do more of we've decided we want to make a school at first online and then hopefully eventually it will become a real bricks and mortar place but we well me particularly I'd really like to know building from the core course of making a painting from design to finished canvas I would like to know what other things people would like to learn how to do and we want to kind of span a range of things from as meticulous and precise as learning how to just paint clouds and as wide and broad as just the process of creativity which Dad particularly likes to talk about and has a lot of fantastic interviews with other people that we'd like to incorporate as well. Mm. Um, so I'd really like to know if there's anything in particular that you guys would like to do if you imagine going to the Dean School of Art what would you want to leave those doors with your certificate in hand and your mortarboard hat having learnt what would you like in your head after that experience what would you like to be able to do so we've, we've built this core course and we're going to be adding on and expanding out and we want to know what you want to be able to do Thank you very much and hope to see you Monday. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>